Well, Anton, uh, thank you so much for being willing to do this interview. Really looking forward to this conversation. And I actually just want to jump right into your story. There's a few elements of your story that uh, I just think are worth people hearing about. And the first one is uh, you grew up in a, in a family with generations of military service. Um, mm -hmm. And as a result, it sounded like, you know, your dad had to travel a lot. And so there are pieces of your life where your dad wasn't always around. And it sounded like pretty early on in your teenage years, you were headed in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had experience, which I believe you actually got arrested that kind of changed the trajectory of your life forever. Can you take us to, to that version of Anton and where you were and how that changed your life? Yeah. So um, a great place to start. So first and foremost, um, come from a long family military. Great grandfather served in both world wars, grandfather, World War II. My grandmother was actually a welder in a Navy shipyard uh, during World War II. So she helped to build three carriers. Um, they had four kids. My grandparents had four kids, my dad and all of his brothers. Each of them put on a uniform and served in the United States military. And my dad was in the Navy for 22 years. And if you know anybody who's in the Navy or uh, related to the Navy, you know, they do these things called cruises where for six months out of a year, uh, that Navy ship is gone, uh, you know, overseas somewhere. They're in the Mediterranean or the Persian Gulf or uh, in the Pacific region. It doesn't matter where they are, but they're gone. And so a lot of my life growing up, uh, my dad, who was in the Navy and was assigned uh, to various aircraft carriers and uh, other ships was always gone. And, I, you know, my mom was there. She was a great school teacher, took care of me and my brothers. But when you're raising four boys by yourself and your husband's gone, you know, sometimes you got to not be home all the time. And when she was not home was my time to get into the wrong things. And I'll just kind of <laughs> leave it at that. And uh, I ended up um, getting involved in some uh, nefarious things like actually stealing cars. Wow. And um, I was a young teenager, preteen, 12, 13 years old, uh, joy riding in stolen cars. And I ended up getting caught in a stolen car. And um, I was scared half to death because one thing you should know about my dad is that my dad was similar growing up. He was, you know, got into the wrong things and the Navy kind of turned his life around. But he was like, I was afraid of him in every way, shape, or form, <laughs> like most people are. And my dad used to say stuff to me, and he, you know, he he meant it, but he didn't mean it. Like he would say, "Listen, don't you ever get in trouble, because if you ever get in trouble, what I'm gonna do to you is worse than the trouble that you got in." Okay, and and I'll do my best to take you out. I'm gonna take you out, and it won't matter to me because I can make another baby that looks just like you uh, in a few years. So. That's so beautiful. I was afraid of my dad, right? Just super afraid. So when I got arrested, I would rather them had just put me in prison for 10 years and then <laughs> tell my dad. So let me already be in prison because if I get in trouble and I got to go home and tell my dad what I've done or what I got into, then I'm just going to die. I mean, it's just my life will cease at that point. And while I'm there in this police station um, waiting to see what's going to happen to me for being in this stolen car, uh, a cop, don't even know his name. I couldn't call his name now if you pay me to, um, came in and he kind of took benevolence on me. He says, listen, you were joyriding with two of your friends and uh, those kids are older. We know their names. They've been in the criminal justice system before, uh, but we ain't never seen you, which means you probably ain't never done much before. Mm -hmm. And if you keep hanging around with these bad kids, you're going to end up in juvie hall just like them but I'm going to give you one more chance. And he let me go. And when he let me go, um, I kind of was arrogant about it when I got out of the police station. I was scared to death while I was there, but when I got let go and they walked me out the front door, I wanted to run back to the neighborhood and tell everybody, <laughs> hey, I got arrested, but I got out. Like I did something miraculous That's and so spectacular, funny. right? But on my way home, I ended up stopping by um, a record shop, you know, and I know a lot of people, we don't have a lot of them anymore because we download all of our music, but back in the late eighties and these places you would go to buy these vinyl albums and cassette tapes and later on CDs and the record shop was like my favorite place. And I walked into a record shop on the way home after getting arrested and I saw an album on the shelf uh, in the record shop. And that album 
is the album that I credit with changing the trajectory of my life. And it was a hip hop album made by a rock and roll hall of fame group known as Public Enemy. Hmm. But in 1987, 88, they weren't a rock and roll hall of fame group. Matter of fact, they were unlike every other hip hop group at the time. And what changed my life about the album was that on the cover, it was a picture of two black men behind bars inside of a jail cell. And I had just come out of a police station where I actually saw real bars. Hmm. And I saw this album and I was like, what do these guys do to get arrested? And how do they take a picture from behind bars and make an album? I mean, who are they? And I looked at the top of the album and it said the words public enemy. And I was like, public enemy of what? Public enemy of who? I mean, wh what are they the enemy of? And then on the left side of the album, it said, it takes a nations of millions to hold us back. And I'm like, well, who's trying to hold you back? And I bought that album and I listened to it. And it was the most radical, transformational hip hop music I'd ever heard in my life. And it's where I learned that the public enemy is me. And what do I mean me? Um, that there are systems, organizations, people who want to take me out, who don't want me to be successful. And the more educated I am, the more leader I become, um, the more I will do good things and continue to be a public enemy. And they want to be a public enemy and nobody's going to hold them back. And it was about two years later that Chuck D, the lead singer of Public Enemy, did an interview. And in his interview, he said, the, guy, the host asked him, so did you want to go platinum when you made this album? I mean, did you want to make a million dollars? And Chuck's response was, no, we didn't make this music to make a million dollars or to go platinum. We made this music because we want to create 5,000 new leaders in the black community. Wow. That's and when he said that, I said, I want to be one of those leaders. Hmm. And that began my leadership journey of wanting to try to make a difference in the community to solve the problems that were impact, impacting the African-American community, crime, drugs, gangs, you know, high school dropout rate, everything. It's from that impetus point that I got involved in sports, that I got involved in community programs. I started going to, to, you know, positive efforts and trying to end the apartheid movement in South Africa. I mean, it was so many things I got involved with because that music gave me a social conscience that I didn't have. Wow. It taught me about injustice and unfairness, the things that I saw every day, but I had no lens or context to know that something was wrong, that more black men were going to jail than they were going to college. Mm -hmm. And that I had the ability to do something about that. Number one, go to college and don't go to jail. And, and number two, encourage other people to go to college and not go to jail. Help other people go to college and not go to jail. So that is where my leadership journey begins. I love this so much. You know, one of my favorite things in getting to spend a lot of time with leaders is just hearing oftentimes it's just, it's one relationship. It's one thing that someone said for you, it was one album that mm -hmm. changes everything. And so you just never know the difference you're going to make. And I think a lot of times when we're, we're talking about leadership, you know, or doing leadership interviews, we think about organizational leaders or people that have written books. We don't often give a lot of credit to the, the art community for their leadership. But I think this is a clear example of the impact that they can make. And yeah. so I love this story. So you start getting intentional with your life. We have very similar stories in that respect um, as well. Um, you start being intentional. You go into college and you end up playing football in the mm -hmm. SEC, which again, mm -hmm. I'm from Pittsburgh. I wouldn't say I'm like, I'm a Steeler fan diehard, but college, I, I do enjoy watching the SEC. Um, but you didn't have a great experience. You were playing for South Carolina. Can you walk us through that and, and what you learned yeah. about leadership through your, your college days? Yeah, so there, there's so so many great lessons um, that challenged me that I think it challenged other people that I, I learned from football. So to give it a little bit more context, um, uh, 54 Division One schools wanted me to play football for them, 54. Wow. Big 10, Pac-10, ACC, SEC, you name it. There were schools. Uh, I was a tight end in high school. So okay. this is really important for me. To, to start, I'm glad you asked that question. So I was a tight end in high school. 
I wanted to catch passes and score touchdowns. You know, I was, you know, 6'4", 225, and I ran a 4'6", So I was pretty Ooh. fast, right? right. Yeah. And so I wanted to go to college and play tight end. Well, um, I made the decision to go to the University of South Carolina um, because it was geographically not too far from my hometown of Virginia Beach, Virginia. I know it sounds like a couple states away, but it was about a six hour drive. Hmm. And one of the things that I wanted, I mean, I was 17. Uh, my jersey number in high school was number 87. I was a tight end. I loved the number 87. Everybody knows Rob Gronkowski, probably the most famous number 87 right now in, in football. But, you know, it was my jersey number back in 1991. And so when I was making a decision where I wanted to go to school, uh, I wanted to play tight end. Well, South Carolina said to me, Anton, we think you will be a better outside linebacker than you would be a tight end. And I said, well, you know, I want to play tight end, but I understand, you know, you think I could go pro if I played outside linebacker. And my coaches literally told me that he thought I could go pro as an outside linebacker because I was tall, I was fast, I had good, good body size for, for those positions. But I said, I want to play tight end. And I said, coach, let's do two things. I'm willing to commit to come to South Carolina and play football if you give me my jersey number 87. Because I knew that whether I played offense or defense, I could wear the number 87 and play tight end or outside linebacker. And I said, the second thing is I want you to give me a chance. If you think I'm better at defense, just give me the chance in camp in two a days. And if I don't prove to you that I'm the best tight end on your roster at the end of two days, then I'd be happy to go and play outside linebacker. And he says, you definitely can have both of those, your jersey number, and um, you can try out for tight end in camp. And I showed up on campus on August 7th, 1991, and I was so excited about being there. That was my first day at college in the SEC, uh, going into the SEC, I was so, so excited. Second day was August 8th, 1991, where everything went to the crapper hmm. because I walked into the training room, uh, to the locker room and went to see the equipment manager and said, I'm Anton Gunn here to get my equipment. And they hand me a bag of shorts and sweatshirts and sweatpants and socks and practice jerseys. And I opened the bag and the jersey number was 59. Now, if you don't know anything about football, and I know you do, but some of your listeners may not, there's never been a tight end in the United States of America that wore a number that started with the number 50. If you're wearing a 50, you're on defense primarily, or if you're on offense, you're an offensive lineman. And my coaches moved me to defensive tackle, not, I mean, defensive end. Like, I didn't even get a chance to play <clears throat> tight end or outside linebacker. We, they moved me to defensive end. And uh, I didn't even get a chance to compete. And I was so mentally shook behind that because I had an 87 mindset. I wanted to catch touchdowns. I wanted to scheme up plays and, you know, beat linebackers on routes and, you know, run over safeties and catch touchdowns. But now I was in a three technique or five technique blocking guards and tackles. That's not what I wanted to be doing. And I felt let down. I felt bamboozled, baited and switched, so to speak. And so, you know, imagine going to work at a job where you interview for a position and they tell you you're going to get this job and duties are X, Y, and Z. And the first day you show up to work, they tell you, Oh, we've changed our mind. We're not putting you at X, Y, and Z. You're not in operations anymore. We're putting you in the marketing department. And your boss is not the person who you thought was going to be your boss. You now got a new boss. How comfortable would you be knowing that you just committed to a job, you turn out other offers to take this job, but they switched you into a new place? And so for me, I was emotionally um, beat up behind that. And then it got worse because. I couldn't perform well. You know, when you're when you're out of sync with where you think you're talented and where you're skilled at, it's really hard to perform well, particularly if you don't have the right mindset because your mindset matters more than your skill set. And so I was in this bad mindset for two full years. Wow. 
I never touched the field. Um, I went on an emotional roller coaster. I doubted that I was in the right place. I wanted to transfer. I wanted to quit. But this was pre-transfer portal. So I couldn't just say, oh, you know what? Things ain't working out. Let me stick my name on a website and I'll go get a scholarship at another school. There was no transfer portal in the early 90s. And, and because I came from a military family, my dad was like, you signed up for four years at the University of South Carolina. You're going to honor your commitment to the University of South Carolina. You can't quit. You can't go anywhere else. Right. And so two years I struggled and I ate myself uh, into 275 pounds. So I went from wow. 225 to 250, 250, 260 to 275 in two years. And so when I got up to 275, um, we had four offensive linemen that graduated and a couple of them went on to the NFL. I volunteered to go to the O-line. And so I ended up playing offensive line. And the first time I got any real playing time on the field, I was playing center uh, in college, you know, in the SEC, going against Alabama and Georgia and, you know, Arkansas and all these big time schools. And the lessons that I learned uh, from that is that um, as a leader, you should always keep your promises. And my coaches broke mm -hmm. their promises to me. That's the first lesson. Number two, uh, your mindset is more important than your skill set. That if you don't have the right mindset about what you're doing every day, it won't matter how talented you are, you're going to struggle to find success. You won't be successful without the right mindset. And then when I got on the offensive line is really when my true character really started to form because there's nothing glorious about being on the offensive line. Like literally your name never gets called. The only time your name gets called is when you screw up. <laughs> if you hold, if you trip somebody, if you're an illegal man downfield, if, you know, if you false start, that's when your name gets called. But if you do your job the way you're supposed to do it, nobody will ever know who you are. And that's the good thing, because the greatest attribute of a leader is the one who does the job, not for the glory and not for the fame, but you do the job to make everybody else on the team around you look good. And that if we did our job as offensive linemen, the quarterback's going to look great. The running back's going to look great. The offense is going to score points because we did our job. And, this, and the third lesson that I'll add to that is the greatest leaders don't operate by themselves. That as an offensive line, we had to operate as a team, as a unit, as a group. That we had to be one heartbeat. That as a center, I needed to know what the two guards on the left and right of me were going to do. I needed to know what the left tackle and the right tackle were doing because if I called the protection to the left, a slide protection, and he didn't get the message and I didn't communicate with him clearly in the right tackle, sets outside because he thinks the blitz is coming from his side, but we're all sliding to the left because the corner is blitzing on the left, then somebody's going to get hurt. And so my job as a center is to make sure I communicate effectively, that we operate as a team, that we work as a team, and that we do the job together. And so those are the few lessons that I learned in football. And so football wasn't a great experience for me at all in college. Um, I did learn some great lessons. I had some great teammates, but I knew how to identify a toxic workplace culture because my team was that. And my first year of college, we won three games. We lost six and we tied two. And the schools that we tied was Duke University and Virginia Tech. Now, this is old Virginia Tech before they started winning, before Michael Vick you know, transformed the culture. So they were terrible teams, and we tied them. My second season, we won five games, and we lost six. Third season, we won four games and lost seven. Then our coach got fired, and then we brought in a new coach, and we went six and five. So in my four-year career, we literally were marginal at best. We had a 400 win percentage my four years in college. But guess what? I played college football with 22 players who went on to make it in the NFL. Hmm. So you can't tell me that they, we weren't talented. If I got 22 teammates in a four-year period, who, who some not only made it to the NFL, but they played five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years, 12 years in the National Football League, Super Bowl rings, a couple pro bowlers, 
I, they were talented. We were talented as a team. I know I was talented. But when you're in a bad leadership environment or a bad workplace culture, a bad culture, it doesn't matter how talented you are. It's hard to be successful mm. if you don't have good leadership. That's so good. And so from college, my understanding is you fast forward, you worked some years in healthcare mm -hmm. um, and then got actually frustrated with some of the systems. And so you decided to run for state legislature, legislator. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then got, got walk us through. Yeah. I'm yeah. from state legislator to you ended up being a senior advisor to the president Obama. Yeah. Walk us through that journey. And, and what did you learn about leadership and politics specifically? Yeah. So there's, there's a, there's a lot uh, to unpack. So the first thing was um, I spent 10 years doing community work in healthcare, helping people to get access to insurance, improve their health, making sure hospitals treated people with dignity and respect and, and that they got the best care. That was kind of my mission, if you will. And um, we were trying to do something in healthcare, and we had some politicians who made some promises that they didn't keep. And we lost on a legislative vote, and it made me angry enough that I decided to run for office. Hmm. And so I ran for office, and I ultimately was elected, and I served one term in the state legislature. And some of the lessons that I learned is when you're passionate about something, do something about it. Okay, don't don't wait for somebody else to show up. Like I spent 10 years asking other people to do the right thing. And then they proved that they weren't uh, competent, capable, or courageous enough to do the right thing. And they just didn't do it. So I took matters into my own hand and stopped waiting for Superman. And I showed up myself. That's, good. That's the first lesson. Second lesson is uh, everything that glitters ain't gold. Because when I got into the state legislature, um, I got confronted with a whole bunch of other uh, challenges. One, you know, because I was a freshman lawmaker, I had people who had been there longer than me who wouldn't listen to me because they didn't wow. think that uh, I had enough skills and experience that, Anton, you just got here. You need to figure out where the bathrooms are before you start trying to pass laws and make things better and telling us what we're doing wrong. And I learned that there's no monopoly on good ideas. And I had some good ideas and they refused to listen to me. And it became very frustrating when uh, people don't listen to you and don't value your perspective and um, don't follow you. And I learned that as a leader, you got to um, be the example of the change you want to see in the world. So if you want to be a leader that others will follow, how do you learn how to follow? How do you learn how to uh, listen? and support people on their mission, vision, values, and goals. And so I did that for two years, you know, made some progress, had some impact. And then Barack Obama um, is president of the United States. And um, I had a relationship with his staff team and his campaign team because I worked on his campaign um, before I got elected to the legislature. And they called and asked me to come and serve. And um, there's so much I will tell you about that. The first thing is it was the hardest job of my life because I was working on health care reform uh, or the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare, which we all know was a you know big um, domestic policy challenge for the president. Uh, but I was able to be successful to use my skills as a speaker, um, as a uh, policy expert, as someone who understood complex challenges and could explain them to everyday people uh, to become an effective spokesperson and help them to shape policy. And then I got promoted and they moved me to DC. And next thing I know, I'm in meetings um, telling the president um, how to talk about healthcare reform in a way that um, connects the dots for people so that they can sign up for coverage. And it was uh, one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life working for a president of the United States. 41 months, a lot of hours, sometimes 14, 16, 18 hour days, uh, very little sleep at night, uh, lots of travel. Um, so very hard, but one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. 
Wow. I don't know how much time you got to spend with him. I know you actually ended up writing a book on presidential li- uh, leadership. Not only did you mm-hmm. get to spend time with Obama, of course, you've also spent time with, I believe you said five other or five presidents in total. Um, mm-hmm. What was, did you learn anything from him either, you know, something he invested in mm-hmm. you directly mm-hmm. or just mm-hmm. watching his leadership? Yeah. So I, I did get a chance to spend a fair amount of time with uh, Barack, um, president Obama, um, I, before he was president, I spent time with him. And while he was president, I, I was in multiple meetings with him, uh, some in the Oval Office, but many times in the Roosevelt Room. And here's what I will tell you. There's so many great lessons that I, I could take away that I learned uh, watching Barack Obama and working with him. But I'm going to give you three ones that I think are really important and sometimes are unappreciated um, when we're on a leadership journey. Lesson number one is always surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and ask them for their advice and listen to what they have to say. Barack Obama was totally unafraid to have people with differing opinions than him, perspectives that were different than him, who knew more about a subject than he did. And he invited them in the room and he asked their opinions. And then he massaged these different arguments together and separated them out. And then he would make the executive decision. So always surround yourself with people who know more than you do. Second lesson is to love your family unconditionally and never be afraid to show people that you love them. Um, Show them your humanity. Uh, We know that Barack Obama loved Michelle Obama and he loves Sasha and Malia. And he was unabashedly, um, he was unabashed about it. He was not afraid to show that he loved his wife and he loved his family, that he was a family man. And what that did for me, it reminded me that when you reach the highest levels of leadership, you need people who are going to keep you grounded. Mm -hmm. People who actually don't care at all about what you do every day but they just care about you. And if you got children, you know that they just care about you. They, dad's title doesn't matter. Mom's title doesn't matter. You're dad. You're not Mr. President. You're not the 44th. You're not the CEO. You're not the director of operations. Nobody cares about your title when you go home. They care about you. And so the lesson that I learned from that is Make sure that you care about those people who care about you as an individual and not just you as a leader. The third lesson that I'll give you that I learned from Barack Obama is, and this is one that I kind of already embodied, but he kind of reaffirmed it in me, is never be afraid to do big things. Hmm. Never be afraid to try things. Never be afraid to fail because that's where the most growth happens. And so being president of the United States in an economic recession, losing 700,000 jobs a month, everybody screaming at you, focus on the economy, focus on the economy, focus on the economy. And in your first joint address to Congress, in the middle of the speech, you start talking about health care reform. And everybody's like, what? What are you talking about? We're losing 700,000 jobs. We're losing 900,000 jobs. We got the war in Iraq over here. Why in the heck are you talking about healthcare reform in the middle of an economic recession? Why? Because he knew it was a big, hard thing that 11 other presidents before him had talked about and tried to do, but didn't get done. And because healthcare is 20% of our GDP, that if you actually do something in healthcare, you actually save the economy. You help the economy. And so I've learned that lesson that don't be afraid to do big things. Don't be afraid to walk away from a corporate job and start your own leadership consulting practice. Don't be afraid to write a book. Don't be afraid to write your third book uh, or start working on your fourth book. Don't be afraid to do anything, right? Leaders have to take opportunities, take risks. And I learned that wholeheartedly from Barack. Yeah. 
And I love what you were just saying, because those are all things that you've just done. And I do want to dive into to your book and your leadership practice. Last question I do want to ask, though, we live in such a politically divided nation. Mm -hmm. and again, so much of that is driven by the media and people's mm -hmm. views. But you were actually, you know, you're in the room where it happens, right? Mm -hmm. yes. in Hamilton. Is yes. there anything that you would tell leaders about politics that you wish they knew as they, you know, watch CNN and Fox News and just get more and more divided? Anything yeah. you wish leaders? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say um, I wish people would have a better appreciation um, of the humanity of people. Like that, there, there's nothing special about any political leader other than they put their name on a ballot and happen to win. They're no different than you. As a matter of fact, let's be clear. I think some of the best leaders that would do great in public service are the ones who say that they will never run hmm. because they think it's something else other than what they do every day. But the, the strongest leader, the, that leader who's the most successful leader in the workplace, you know, they got high engagement on their teams. They always meet their goals. They give back to the community. They serve on nonprofit boards. They volunteer at church or their, their kid's school. Those are the people who we need more of in public service. And a lot of people who are in public service fit that same profile. So see the humanity in people and don't, you know, put them on a pedestal like they're somehow different than you because they're not. I'm here to tell you that Barack Obama gets fussed at for not picking up his laundry the same way my wife fusses at me for not picking <laughs> up my laundry. The, the same way my office is a mess, his office is a mess. You know, we're all human, right? Right. Yeah. That's so good, Anton. So you were talking about, you know, the audacity it takes to jump and start your own leadership practice. That's something you've done. And it's been clear just in you sharing your story today. You know, you've been a leader from a young age and been intentional about that and grown as a leader. So now you, you launched a company, I believe it's called 937, which I do if we have time. Uh, I would love for you to just give a brief reason why. I love why you yeah. named it what you named it. <laughs> um, but then I want to talk about your new book and how you can help leaders today. So yeah. tell us about 937. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm um, happy to do so. So my company is called the 937 Strategy Group. It's 937strategygroup.com. You're going to check it out. So um, I'm a leadership junkie, okay? And I find leadership lessons in almost everything. It doesn't matter what it is. In a song, in a television show, and in movies. And the greatest leadership movie in my lifetime and it is my favorite movie of all time. My favorite movie of all time. That movie is Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Samuel Jackson, John Travolta, Quentin Tarantino. It's a classic. It's a cult classic that should have won Best Picture in 1994 if it wasn't for Forrest Gump disrupting it. I'm still <laughs> mad about that. And there's a scene in Pulp Fiction that describes me how I do business as a consultant and as a leadership advisor. And the scene is in that movie. And it's the movie about the Bonnie situation. And I won't recount the whole movie for everybody, um, but there's a scene in the movie where Samuel L. Jackson and John Travolta are driving in a car and a gun goes off and a person in the car with them um, dies and his head gets blown off. And his, the car is a mess, there's blood all over the place. So they get the car off the road to a guy named Jimmy's house. Jimmy's wife is Bonnie. And Bonnie works the night shift at the hospital. And her husband is scared to death that Bonnie is going to come home and find a couple gangsters in the house with a, a car in her garage with a headless body in there. It's a big mess, right? And so John Travolta and Samuel L. Jackson have to call their boss to figure out what to do. Boss, we don't know what to do. We got this mess. We made a mess. It's our fault. We screwed it up. We just have no idea what to do. And so Samuel Jackson's on the phone complaining to his boss about the problem. And the boss is like, well, I'm just contemplating what we should do. I don't know necessarily what to do. And Samuel Jackson says, you need to fix this. You need to fix this. And the boss says, don't worry about it. I'm sending the wolf that's coming. And the wolf is Harvey Keitel's character who is at a dinner party. He's having a good time. He's kind of sitting like I'm sitting right now in a hotel room with a jacket on. He's having a great time. He takes notes on everything that the boss says about what the problem is. And then he says, 
where is it again? He says, in Toluca Lake. And he looks at his watch. He says, that's 45 minutes away. I'll be there in 10 minutes. In the next scene of the movie, you see Harvey Keitel's car pulling up. And on the screen, it says nine minutes and 37 seconds later. <laughs> 937. He knocks on the door and he says, you must be Jimmy. I understand that you have a problem. My name is Winston Wolf. I solve problems. And he comes in the house and he quickly assesses the situation, the mess that they've made, the difficulty of the problem. He assesses the whole environment and all of the people involved. And then he starts telling people what to do. And he tells them what to do because he knows how to solve their problem. He's, he's seen enough problems that he knows how to solve their problem. Well, then John Travolta gets a little snippy because he doesn't like being talked to the way that the wolf is talking to him. And the wolf says very clearly, if I'm being curt with you, it's because time is of the essence. And if you want your problem solved, I will solve it. But if you think you got it better than I do and you can figure it out, lots of luck. I'm going to go back to my life and enjoy my life because I don't have to be here. And that's how I am as a leadership consultant, is that I've seen enough mess that I know how to solve problems. And I'm going to give you clear, consistent, directive ways to solve that problem. But I don't want to work with anyone who's not interested in having the problem solved. So if you think you got a better mousetrap than me, then by all means, I don't want to be a conflict. I don't want to be in the way. I'm going to go back to cheering my daughter on in her softball games and spending time with my wife and having fun. But if you want help to solve your workplace culture challenges, to fix the toxic culture in your workplace and to develop leaders who know how to build diverse high-performing teams, then that's what I'm going to do for you. But if you don't, lots of luck. That's the greatest pitch and way to name your company I've ever heard. I absolutely love that. So you've written, so you help companies, you help leaders, <clears throat> coaching, consulting, speaking. You've written mm -hmm. three books. Uh, mm -hmm. Your third one actually is available today for pre-order. Yes. Yes. And so it's called Lead or Just Lead. And you have 44 mm -hmm. principles. You've written a book on presidential leadership, which we talked about. And then I believe your first book was The uh, uh, Audacious Leadership, which focused kind of on what you learned from your journey as a young leader. Talk yes. to us about your new book. Why do you write this and what do you want leaders to get out of it? Yeah. So my, my new book, Just Lead, and uh, I'm tell everybody where you can get it. You can get it on Amazon for pre-order right now. Uh, it's available on all places, retailers, where you would normally get a book. I wrote this book as what I call the unbook. Now, when I say unbook, a lot of people write big, thick books that you never really get through the whole book because it's too long. They're telling too many stories and they're you know, not really giving you the meat and the crux of what you need to have an impact. And I wrote this book to solve a problem. And there are three problems that we have right now in the American workplace. When you hear terms like quiet quitting, when you hear terms like the great resignation, when people start talking about the challenges around diversity, equity, and inclusion, here are the three problems. Number one, there are barriers inside of organizations. There's barriers between people. There's barriers between teams where the marketing department never talks to operations and senior leadership never talks to frontline staff. I mean, all kinds of barriers, right? We gotta find a way to break down these barriers. The second problem is that people are quitting jobs in droves. I mean, like 80 million people have quit a job since January of 21. Wow. 80 million people have walked away from a job and most of them didn't have another job. They're sick and tired of being sick and tired and people are walking away. The pandemic made it worse. So people. Uh, companies are not retaining their top talent. They're losing their talent. And the third thing is, is that even for the people who stay behind, they're being mistreated, disrespected, not valued in the workplace. And so the culture is not great. And this book are 44 actions that will help you to break down barriers, boost your retention, and build a world-class culture. I teach you in this book how to answer the three fundamental questions that every employee asks every day when they show up to work. And so for everybody who's listening to this or watching this, here's what I want you to understand. It doesn't matter what role you play. You might be a frontline person who wants to be a leader and 
you deal with customers every day. Your customers are asking these same three questions. Everybody wants to know the following. Number one, do you care about me? Number two, will you help me to be successful? And number three, can I trust you? And in the American workplace, we have so many leaders who verbally say yes to those three questions, but their actions say no. That they really don't know how to show the people that they lead that they care about them. That they don't really know how to help them to be successful. And because they can't do the first two, they're not trusted leaders. And when people don't trust you, is a reason why they will quit, the reason why they will isolate themselves from you, and the reason why they will feel like their workplace is toxic. So this book lays out an action plan for you as a leader to just lead. If you just lead, you'll break down the barriers. If you just lead, you'll boost your retention. And if you just lead, you will build a world-class culture. And I'm giving you simple, direct actions that you can implement starting today. There's nothing, you know, you got, you don't have to get a PhD to just lead. You just need to get this book and follow these actions, implement these actions, get to know the people that you lead, learn how to serve them, how to equip them with tools and information and resources to be successful. And if you do that, you will become a leader that everyone admires. And the more leaders that you have that are admired by everybody in your organization, the greater the culture you will build. And that's what the book is about. So good, Anton. And we'll include links to the book. In fact, all of your books in the show notes. So make sure you go out and get a copy. And if it impacts you, buy a copy for your team uh, or other leaders that you know as well. Uh, in the few minutes we have left, I want to dive into the lightning round. I'm going to add a few questions just based on what you do, because I want to hear your answers. Sure. Uh, so let's have some fun. But one, you're a professional speaker. You've gotten to speak on some of the world's biggest stages. You lectured at Harvard for a, a whole semester and got to live there. I've had incredible experiences. What advice would you give quickly to uh, aspiring speakers? Uh, first piece of advice to, to every aspiring speaker is never tell a story without a point <laughs> and never make a point without telling a story. Uh, and that came from Charlie Tremendous Jones, and it was an early lesson that I learned. And if you're going to tell people a story, what's the point of the story? And how does the point of that story apply to their lives? The greatest speakers are the ones who tell the best stories and got points that are applicable to everyday lives. And so that's my best advice for you. Great, same question, only when it comes to aspiring authors. You've written three books now. It sounds like you're starting to work on your fourth. Yeah. Yes. So my advice to aspiring authors um, is to don't make it more complicated than it has to be. Hmm. And so keep it simple. Make sure that your books, you can clearly know what the book is about in one word. So if you could boil your book down, whatever you decide to write, make it be about one major thing. And so keep it simple. Love it. Um, this is a new one I'm adding to the lightning round, but I'm curious. Uh, do you have a favorite uh, tool, resource, or service that you started using recently that you couldn't live without that you'd recommend for leaders? Oh, wow. That's a great one. Um, I would say... Um, I'm a I'm a, an audible guy <laughs> and I read a lot of books. Uh, I got great libraries at home of books that I read, but Audible has made it easy for me to consume book content. And I know some people don't do audio books for whatever reason, but I will tell you that I walk about 5 miles every day and it's about a 90 minute walk every morning. And because I walk every day, I'm listening to an audio book um, every time that I'm walking and I go through 20, 30 books a year, audible wise. And then I read another 20, um, just flipping pages through books. And so audible is always a strong one for me. That's a, that's a simple old school hack, if you will, but it's one that I rely on. Yeah. If you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? The quote is never, there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. I think I saw that never in your email. Yes. Well. Is that your email? So good. Yes. Um, you've gotten to spend time with obviously world class leaders. Uh, I'm curious when you get when you get dinner or lunch uh, with a leader, is there a go to question or two that you always ask? Um, yeah. 
couple questions. Number one question, what keeps you up at night? That's always, you know, one of the questions that I ask. Um, and then the next question that I always ask is, uh, 10 years from now, when you're gone from this organization, uh, what do you want to be remembered for the most? And then, um, who are your mentors? Hmm. Third question. What's your biggest leadership pet peeve? Uh, my leadership pet peeve is leaders who don't know their team. Mm. And what I mean, don't know their wow. team, you got to know the people that you lead. It's hard to care about people that you that you don't know, right? So when I go back to those three questions, do you care about me? How do you answer the question that I care about you if I don't even know who you are? Wow. If I don't know, you know, what's important to you? So that's my pet peeve is leaders who don't know the people that they lead. You've had some incredible experiences in your life. I'm curious, what's something you've done in your life that you believe everyone should do before they die? Um, wow, that's a deep question. <laughs> um, I would say uh, everyone needs to travel abroad. Mm. Um, the, the best education I get is because I have a passport. And as big as the United States is, the world is so much bigger. And I think everybody should travel abroad. So good. If you can go back and have coffee with yourself, if you drink coffee at any age, what age would you have coffee with yourself? And what would you tell that version of Anton that would have helped? Yeah, I don't drink coffee. Um, I think I've had three cups in my life. Um, a tea drinker, green tea. Me too, man. Especially. Me too. Yeah. yeah. But if I was going back in time um, to have coffee with myself, I would go back to uh, 25-year-old Anton Gunn, who had just met this young lady named Tiffany, a beautiful woman. And I would tell him that you need to love her every day from now until you decide to marry her. Hmm. Love it. And then last question, it sounds like you asked leaders this, but in your lifetime, looking back, what do you want to be remembered for? Uh, I want to be remembered for making, um, I want to be remembered for, for making sure that leaders understood that their moral code should be about justice, should be about um, doing the right thing no matter what. And uh, I think justice is the cornerstone of how we get great leaders. leaders. Leaders have the opportunity to make things right for people, whether you created the wrong or not. I mean, somebody else might have screwed it up, but you have the opportunity to make it right because you're in a leadership position. And I think sometimes we forget that that's our responsibility is to try to make it right. And to do that means to live justly. Anything else you want to leave leaders with today? No, everybody, you can go to antongun.com and get a copy of Just Lead um, or at Amazon, or wherever books are sold, and make sure you leave an honest review on Amazon. Uh, that will be helpful. You got it. Well, thanks for the conversation. This added massive value to my life, Anton, and I'm sure everyone who listens to this will think the same. And hopefully we'll get to do it again sometime. Yes, it'd be great. Thank you. 